everybody. It's lovely to be here again to worship God on this Sunday morning. And wherever you're joining us from, whenever you're listening, God is here. He is at work today in your joys and in your sorrows. He draws near to those who call on his name. In today's service, Simon will be starting a series in James, and we look forward to that later on. And we'll also be celebrating communion together. Well, if like me this week, you've been really all too aware of your weaknesses, I thought you might be helped by something I read in my daily reading, just on the right day. It's from this little book. Often our temptation is to elevate our weaknesses above grace. God calls us to elevate his grace and love above all else. God says to us today, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And then the author of this book, Kate Patterson, has written a little verse about that. Grace is always more, more than debts paid for. Grace enriches me. More than my striving, grace empowers me. More than my fears, grace emboldens me. More than my aspirations, grace surprises me. Grace is always more. And she finishes with a little bit from Mother Teresa who says, Believe much more in his love than your own weaknesses. So we're going to start our sung worship this morning by declaring that Jesus is Lord. Lord of life, Lord of death, Lord of everything, and he will bring us home. Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation. Let's sing together. Well, Ray and I went on a walk this week. I took him up on his offer, uh, like I know many of you have. And uh, he took me to one of his favourite places, the Howell Hill Nature Reserve. And uh, I was thrilled to realise that it was one of my favourite places to play as a child. Um, we approached it from the Howell Hill end, but I used to live in Cheam, and it was where my friends and I used to play. There was a chalk hill and a grass hill, and we used to sledge there in the winter. So it was a real thrill to realise this was the same place all those years later. And uh, he showed me some of his most favourite things. Uh, And this is one of the orchids that he really loves. This is a pyramidal orchid. And uh, this was hiding away under the leaves. And then uh, we found one of these, which is a common spotted orchid. If you look at the leaves down the bottom, they've got spots on them, that's why it's spotted. And, uh, but he told me that his most favorite, which we saw one of, but I didn't get a good picture, so I'm afraid this is from Google, the bee orchid. And he loves it because it's so intricate and looks just like a little bee landing on a plant. And I understand that completely. It's beautiful how detailed and intricate it is. Um, and in this time of lockdown, we've got used to it admiring the detail and the beauty in miniature that God has created all around us. But I don't know about you, I'm also yearning for a longer view of some mountains or a lake or maybe even the ocean or the sea, a very long view. 
But here's the amazing bit. God made them both. He made the tiny little details and the enormous expansive view. He cares about both and he created them both for our pleasure. And in fact, the Bible tells us that God can count every hair on our head. And there's a few more on each of our heads at the moment than we perhaps would like. But he also created the stars and the planets. He does detail and he does enormity. So at the moment, whether you're puzzling over the detail of trying to get exam information into your memory and into your heads, or whether you're wondering and worried about something much bigger than that for you, he understands and he knows about both. He cares about the detail in our lives and the big picture of where we're heading or even the world problems that we're going through at the moment. God is in control of life, the universe and everything. Let's pray together. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you care about all of our lives, the little things that bother us and the big things that are too big for us to manage. Thank you that you are totally loving and totally good and can be trusted with all of our worries and troubles in life. Please help us to bring them all to you because you care and work all things together for good for those who love you. Amen. Well, Jesus had to trust his father as he anguished in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was taken away to the cross. And this next song is based on part of that prayer. Um, and I thought it would be a good uh, precursor to our communion together that Norman's going to lead just after. So this song is, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And some of us will be learning it and join in as you can. Here it is. Good morning. This past week, I've returned from some time overseas and um, I've had the pleasure of uh, having to put myself into quarantine for 14 days. It's a slightly strange thing to have to do because I've come back from a part of the world where the rate of uh, COVID infection is much lower than it is here. Uh, it's odd because normally uh, you would put yourself into quarantine when you come from a place of high infection and you don't want to bring it back into a place of lower infection. But uh, those are the rules and so I will uh, gladly go along with them and keep myself in quarantine. But it made me think about um, the journey that Jesus made from the absolute purity, the absolute lack of infection of anything that was godless or sinful in heaven and he stepped into our world full of sin, full of godlessness and uh, heartache and disease. And rather than uh, locking himself away to protect himself, he stepped right into the middle of our infection, as it were. Normally, when an infected person comes into contact with an uninfected person, the direction of travel of infection is from the infected to the previously uninfected. With Jesus, we see the opposite. He came into our world. When he met, for example, with a person who was suffering from highly infectious leprosy, Jesus reached out and touched him, something that uh, the person with leprosy would have been really unfamiliar with because people normally shied away and wouldn't dream of uh, touching the person with leprosy for fear of getting infected. But Jesus touched him 
And instead of the infection traveling from the man with leprosy to Jesus, health was transmitted from Jesus to the man with leprosy, and the leprosy left him. And it was a very wonderful miracle. And right there is a picture of what happened when Jesus stepped into the midst of our broken and infected world. His purity drove out the, uh, the wrong and the infection and the sin of our world. We see him uh, being willing to be infected by all that was wrong with our world. Though he did nothing wrong, he nonetheless was punished by uh, violent and evil people and put to death on the cross. He bore the consequences of sin without being a sinner. But at the same time, the consequences of his health, his purity, his sinlessness got transmitted to us, or at least to us who are willing to receive his healing and his forgiveness and his purity. As we come to communion, we're reminded of that, that uh, through the wonderful gift of Jesus, giving himself to the worst that our world has to offer, not quarantining himself away so that nothing bad happened to him, but embracing the pain of all that's wrong in our world, we can know all that's right in heaven. And uh, when our time comes, we can walk through the front door of heaven into the throne room of God without ever being placed in quarantine because Jesus says, he's with me, she's with me. At communion, we uh, symbolize the way in which the health and the, the body and blood of Jesus can be ours, can flow through our veins, can clothe us by partaking of bread and wine. And we invite all who know and love the Lord Jesus, who accept that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for you and for me. We invite you to share in the broken bread and the wine in memory and remembrance of what Jesus has done until he comes. We do need to examine ourselves. This is an important thing. We can't do it lightly. We ought to examine ourselves, the scripture tells us, before we eat the bread and drink from the cup. Because to do so lightly is to invite judgment on ourselves for our carelessness and our lack of seriousness about what Jesus has actually done. But don't ever let this call to examine ourselves be something that prevents us from reaching out and taking the bread and wine if we truly believe that what Jesus has done for us. Because remember, we can't ever qualify to uh, be worthy of his broken body and his shed blood. We're sinners. That's, that's why he died for us. He knows there's a problem with us. All we have to do is acknowledge that we're sinners who need the life that comes from his body and blood. So let's examine ourselves for a moment. Uh, and uh, if you're ready to go ahead and take the bread and the wine, then please do so. The Lord invites you to come knowing what you're really like and only calling for an open and honest heart uh, before him. Let's just pray. Lord, we know we're not worthy to share in the life of heaven that comes from you, from your broken body and shed blood. But we thank you that you have given those things for us precisely because we need you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the bread, which is uh, symbolizing your body and the blood, no, the, the wine, which is symbolizing your blood. And we take off them uh, in remembrance of you. Amen. So the Bible tells us the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
So if you're ready to do it in remembrance of Jesus, let's take of the bread now. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so let's drink together in remembrance of him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for feeding us, not just with this physical bread and this physical wine, but you've fed us in our hearts by faith so that we may partake of the life of heaven. And for that, we thank you so much this morning, Lord. Amen. Well, now Ray is going to lead us in prayer. Over to you, Ray. Let's pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, thank you for our world. And thank you, Lord, that although there is much suffering, thank you for the chance for some of us at least to explore the natural world around us and to see the hand of the Creator God who painted the colours on exquisite things such as butterflies and flowers. And you did that with love and for all of us to enjoy. Lord, we praise you for everything, for all good gifts come from you, the beautiful weather, our food and drink, and for all the things we should not be have taken for granted. But obviously, Lord, not all is right in our world. The coronavirus pandemic is leaving everyone, is leaving hardly anyone untouched. Lord, we pray for the people who are bereaved, who have lost close family and friends. Please comfort them by your spirit. We pray for those in the front line, health services around the world, doctors, nurses, and all manner of people in the fight against the virus. Thank you, Lord, for them and bless them. Where would any one of us be without them? Lord, we pray for those who are persecuted for you throughout the world. Please strengthen them in their faith when people insult them and say all kinds of evil against them because of you. Help them to rejoice and be glad because great is their reward in heaven. You said that, Lord Jesus. Therefore, this promise won't be broken. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our government as lockdown laws are relaxed, wisdom to react to the violence in our streets. Lord, we do want to pray for a revival of peace in our country and a revival of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we do want to pray for our own church too. We pray for our leaders, for wisdom regarding how to reopen our church safely and to look forward to meeting one another again to worship you. Finally, Father, our church locally, nationally and internationally is not immune to racism. Please shine a light where it exists and help us to stamp it out. For as God's people, it definitely has no place because the precious blood of Christ has purchased people from every tribe and every language and every people and nation to be a kingdom of priests to serve our living God. Thank you once again, Lord, for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
and now we're going to hear our reading from James chapter 1 and verses 1 to 15. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away, even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Well, Simon's going to speak to us. Simon, hello. Hello. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you there. Thank you. Shall um, I pray for you before you begin? Yes, please. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us all that we need to follow you and to live life according to your purposes. And we pray now that you will help Simon as he speaks and us as we listen to hear your truth and to act on it. In Jesus' name. Amen. We are uh, beginning a series uh, called Caught in Two Minds, uh, a study in the book of James, and I hope you'll understand why it's called that a bit later. And today we're going to look at what Sarah uh, read for us, which is on the subject of tests, trials, and temptations. Um, I want to say something about the book of James. I'll come onto the background a bit later. But it's not always the most popular book among evangelicals. I mean, the great reformer Martin Luther considered it fit for the oven, <laughs> an epistle of straw, he called it, put Jim, Jimmy in the oven, he said. And the reason he said that was because he thought it seemed to run contrary to Paul's teaching about needing to be saved by faith in Christ alone. Because James is quite a practical book and talks about many practical things we need to do. Uh, but I trust as we go along uh, in this series, you'll understand that that is not the case. James is not against Paul. Uh, he is complimentary and uh, it's very much uh, inspired by God and does not contradict the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Many scholars, though, when they look at the book of James, they think it's a bit of a jumble. You know, a jum they call it jumbled James because they can't discern any thread running through it. He seems to hop around 
One minute he talks about wisdom. The next minute he talks about the use of your tongue. The next minute he talks about wealth. He talks about temptation. And it's tempting to ask James, what are you, is, why are you jumping around? And some people think it's like wisdom literature, like the book of Proverbs. You know, book of Proverbs, it's just uh, a statement on this and a statement on that with no particular uh, theme. And there are 54 commands in the book of James. But I want to suggest to you that there is a theme running through it. Um, and you might find that picture rather strange, but that is a picture of uh, obviously some books and what you call bookends. Uh, bookends. Now, I've chosen a cat because obviously we have a cat and we're very much in love with it at the moment. <laughs> but the bookends, uh, why am I putting that picture on there? Well, one way that you can find out perhaps what a theme that runs through a book is to look at the bookends. That means to look at the first chapter and to look at the last chapter in the book, of, in the book that you're studying. So, you know, you ask the question, is there a key theme that appears at the start of the book? Then it might appear quite jumbled and you might get glimpses of that theme resurfacing. Uh, uh, you might catch the tune occasionally as you go through the book. And you need to ask the question about the final bookend. Does the theme reappear again at the end of the book? And I want to suggest to you that there is a theme that appears at the start of James and reappears at the end of James. And I think this is the, if you like, the thread running through the book. I mean, there are many other things James talks about, but I would say this is the main thread. You will notice in what Sarah read that in chapter 1, verse 8, James talks about a double-minded person. And he talks about, in verse 6, about not asking with doubt. And he seems to be referring to someone who is torn between God and the world. And later on, as you read through James, you, he comes up with this phrase, the friend of God, like Abraham or Rahab, because they put all their trust in God, opposed to a friend of the world. And he talks about an adulteress. So there seems to be this idea that surfaces quite early on about double-mindedness and about are you going to be a single-minded person or are you going to be a double-minded person and be swayed by the world? And towards the end of the book, right at the end, he mentions a man called Elijah in a prayer. And I know the sort of theme there is prayer, but Elijah was praying on Mount Carmel when he was bringing double-minded Israel back to the Lord. The prayer that Elijah prayed, referred to in that end of the book of James, is Elijah praying for double-minded Israel, saying, look, he actually says, you know, how long will you dither between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, or if Baal which is a, was a false god, if he's the god, follow him. He's saying, make your mind up. Stop being double-minded. And it seems to be that James wants the believers to whom he is writing to be steadfast and single-minded and not be like that people of Israel who were double-minded. <clears throat> and then at the very end of the book of James, the final part of the bookend, you'll notice that he talks about bringing back someone who's wandered away from the truth. So I want to suggest that the key theme, the main motorway, if you like, that runs through the book of James is a call to be single-minded and steadfast and faithful to the Lord, despite all the pressures, and to not go into the dangerous trap of becoming a bit worldly and double-minded. I would say that's the main theme. Now, so I, that's what I, I'm sticking my colours to the mast. I think it's double-mindedness is quite a key uh, theme. And there are certain questions that arise throughout the book. Here are some. You know, will you take a worldly attitude? For example, when you have a trial, if a trial hits you, are you going to behave like the world and just grumble and moan? Or are you going to count it as joy? Are you going to have a wordy attitude? That means based on the Bible or a worldly attitude? What are you going to choose? 
I've already mentioned the double mindedness. Are you going to wander away from God uh, when you're under temptation, when you're under trial, when you're considering money and wealth? What are you going to do? Are you going to be single mindedly Christian about those things? Are you going to be a steadfast Christian? Are you going to be an adulterous friend of the world or are you going to be a faithful friend of God? So I think those, that's the key theme uh, we're going to unpack throughout this series, as well as looking at other parts of the book. I don't know if you've ever been driving along a motorway and you notice someone in front of you is swerving from left to right. Perhaps they're a sleepy head. Perhaps they you know, haven't had enough of a coffee break or perhaps they're drunk. But it seems to be that James is writing to Christians who were wavering, who were doing this, <laughs> you know. And I want to say, give a reason for that. <clears throat> you will have noticed in Sarah's reading that the audience to whom James was writing, he says, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, various scholars have different opinions on who those people are. But the most evidence seems to, to, to suggest that they were Jewish Christians, people who'd become Christians, who had been scattered because of persecution, probably around the time when uh, Stephen was stoned to death, uh, if you remember that story in the book of Acts. And because they were scattered into this, uh, among the nations because of the persecution at the time of Stephen, they were suffering trials. They were suffering temptations. They were suffering worries about wealth. Some were rich, some were poor, some were really struggling. They were um, struggling uh, in terms of how they react with their tongue, you know, how they speak about what was going on. And they had pressure from external trials and internal temptations. Now, an external trial is something that affects you outwardly a circumstance. I mean, these people were probably, they'd lost their jobs. Some were being exploited as immigrant labor. Some were being mocked and laughed at by where, because they had to move away because of the persecution. But they were also being tempted inside. They were, you know, like some of them had no money. So they'd be like thinking, I need to have money in order to be significant, not just to survive, but I, I need to have status. So there were all these pressures upon the people to whom James wrote. Now, moving on, I want to look at just four areas where James says we are to have a single-minded focus or Christian attitude found in this chapter. Number one, so there are four points. <laughs> Number one, have a single-minded Christian attitude to trials. I mean, it sounds like madness, doesn't it? But this is what we read. Uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, I don't know if you realize, but the word trouble or tribulation that we use today which is also another word for trials, uh, comes from the Roman word tribulum. And the tribulum was a Roman agricultural sledge used to drag across corn. And the way you'd make it was you'd get a wooden board, you'd turn it upside down, you'd make some holes, and you'd put in some sharp flint, uh, flint stones into the bottom of the board. Then you'd get a cow or a donkey to drag it over the corn and it would thresh the wheat and what it would do is it would cut out the chaff and it would separate the ears of grain. I think that's a wonderful picture of when we go through trouble. Doesn't it, doesn't it feel like that to you when you go through a trial that it's like someone's dragged a sledge across your back full of sharp stones? <laughs> it's, it's like really horrible. It's not a nice thing and yet James is saying that we are to count it pure joy when this sort of stuff happens to us. I mean, that's madness, isn't it? I mean, the world, the world would react by grumbling and moaning and wanting to get out of it as quickly as possible. But there is a command here. James 
he commands us to count it pure joy. Thankfully, he doesn't say you have to enjoy it. Uh, that would be terrible if he said you've got to enjoy it, because we can't. But he says you can count it as joy. That means you can mentally say, I'm going to view this trial as a means to my benefit, as a means to my maturity, as a means to my perseverance. I am going to count this on the joy side. I'm not just going to moan about it like my neighbours. I'm going to put this under the column called joy because it's for my benefit. And I'm going to trust that God can work through this horrible tribulation or trial. Um, I love the paraphrase of John chapter 16, verse 33, where Jesus said, in the world, you will have big trouble, <laughs> uh, but cheer up because I'm on top of it. Um, I also once heard a preacher say that when you go through a trial, it, in it introduces you to a friend called Percy. <laughs> Percy, a man called Percy. His surname is Verence. So you get introduced to a friend called Perseverance. And many Christians need to meet Perseverance because it brings maturity. It bring, a trial can bring fortitude, staying power, heroic endurance. And all mature Christians have suffered in some way for their benefit. Uh, people who don't suffer at all stay as infants. They don't grow. You only really grow, I'm sorry to say, through trials. And James is saying you need to view trials with a steadfast Christian mindset. Don't be double-minded like the world and start moaning and complaining and griping and just going and sulking. You need to see it. God is allowing these things for our benefit and view it with faith. It's rather like um, tempering a sword. You know, if you're going to make a steel blade quite strong, you have to put it in the fire. And that's the kind of image uh, trials can be a tool that God uses to refine and purify our faith and make us stronger steel, if you like. And it will lead to maturity, steadfastness, uh, make you someone that others can trust and rely upon. I don't um, say I've mastered this, but I know that's one of the commands in James. We're to count things that are difficult as joy. Okay. Uh, I want to just uh, conclude with my first point with talking about this fellow, Pastor Paul Schneider. Um, he was a German pastor in 19, the early so 1930s. He dared to preach against Hitler. And um, David Pawson, a great preacher, mentions this fellow often because it was David Pawson's hero. He was sent to Buchenwald concentration camp uh, because he preached against Hitler and he was starved there. And eventually uh, he was injected uh, with poison because he would not keep quiet preaching about Christ and the gospel, despite the Nazis telling him to shut up. But the big thing about it was from prison, although his letters were heavily censored, his wife was able to receive letters from Buchenwald and they all contained joy. Joy, 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 joy. And it was like, this is crazy. You should be moaning. You should be scared. But he was full of joy because he knew that God had allowed it. And um, it's a bit like Paul. When Paul was in jail in the Philippian letter, Paul basically says to the church at Philippi, he says, look, I'm rejoicing. What about you? And I'm in prison. You know, Paul was likely to be executed soon. And yet he had this Christian single-minded view of trials that brought joy to his life. And therein lies the challenge. Trials can be used by the Lord for our benefit. So that's my point number one. Moving on swiftly. Point number two, we are to have a single-minded Christian attitude to wisdom. James writes in verse five, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God. <laughs> Don't ask BBC News. Don't ask just your friends and just follow common sense. Ask God. You know, in scripture, God is called the only wise God in the book of Jude, chapter one. The only, uh, the only wise God. And he has wisdom. And the lovely thing about God is he doesn't criticize you when you ask him for it. He doesn't 
do all your shirt buttons up first and say, well, I'll give you wisdom if you first of all do this for me and do that for me and do the other for me. And it would be so easy for God to criticize us. But he does not criticize us. He gives generously because he is a loving God full of love. And if you need wisdom, you need to ask God for it. But I want to say that the wisdom that God gives you is not merely often about making the right decision. It's actually more about behaving in a godly way in the difficulty. So you see, the beginning of wisdom is fear and reverence for the Lord. It's about godliness. It's about behaving in a godly way. It's, it's about how do I handle this trial? How, what is the godly reaction to this trial? Should I just moan and groan? Should I just fly off the handle? Or is there a godly way to respond and react and handle this trial? So it's, it's not just deciding the right thing. It's about behaving in a godly way. Wisdom is, is godliness, actually, in many, many ways. And it's also about learning. What can I learn from this trial? What insight can, what's God teaching me through this? So remember to go to God for your wisdom. Don't just rely on, you know, the latest psychotherapy book only or the latest person on the television. And he says that when you ask God for wisdom, though, you've got to believe that he wants to give it to you because he says, do not doubt and be like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double minded. And unstable in all they do. And the picture of the, the wave of the sea is not one wave going up and down the beach. It's a wave out on the open ocean. And the picture I think James is bringing is a picture of instability, uncertainty. You know a wave, you can't predict what it's going to do. It's going to go this way, going to go that way, it's going to spray, it's, it's just unstable. And he's saying, look, when you're in a trial, ask for godly wisdom and, and believe God will give it to you, and he will. Okay, point number three. James goes on to talk about the rich and the poor in verse 9 and verse 10. And he's saying we need to have a single-minded Christian attitude to riches. It's quite a strange uh, verse, verse 9. He says that uh, believers in humble circumstances should take pride uh, in their high position. <laughs> what? So he's basically telling poor people, you need to be proud of the fact that you're poor. That's not what the world says. If, the, if you're poor, the world says, the world thinking is that, you know, you're not, you're not much good if you haven't got much money. But what James is teaching is that the poor Christian is rich in Christ. He has a rich inheritance in Christ. In fact, Christ has left to the Christian everything in his will and testament. You are extremely rich in Jesus Christ. Never mind the statement, your bank statement, and what's on your bank statement. And then he goes on to say that wealthy people ought to take pride that they are humble. <laughs> what? This is upside down thinking. Well, the reason behind that is because a wealthy person has no advantage before God, except they might be able to use it to help benefit the kingdom of God. They don't take it with them when they die. You see, I've got a picture of a candlestick there. Well, Shakespeare once said that life is like a candle. Uh, and it, it briefly flickers and then you, it sort of blows out. Well, the point is this. Even if you have a very ornate candlestick made of gold, which could picture a wealthy lifestyle, you're still a candle. You're still going to be snuffed out. <laughs> and um, you can't take it with you. James goes on to talk about uh, grass that withers under the hot summer heat. And he says, the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blo its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. And apparently in Israel, there was a certain type of grass which could rise up in the morning and by the end of the day would have been withered by the hot sun. 
And he's saying that's like a rich person. He will fade away even as they go about their business. The only real joy for a rich person is they can use that money to benefit God's kingdom, to invest beyond the grave. Because you see, you can't take it beyond the grave because as an old saying says, a shroud has no pockets. <laughs> you know, a, a person who relies on wealth is like a, um, a flower which has been cut off and put in a vase. It will soon fade. You know, flowers in vases don't last very long. Now, this is completely opposite to how the world views money. On the left-hand side of that chart, I'm not going to read it all, uh, you'll be glad to know, but there's a list of some of the beliefs of the world, how the world thinks, how a friend of the world would think about riches. You know, things such as uh, money gives you worth as a person. Money gives you, brings security. Well, the Bible has a completely different view on wealth and riches. And you can see them uh, written there in red. I mean, I'm only going to pick out one or two for the sake of time. But bring, money brings freedom, the top one. Well, desire for money can be enslaving, according to Scripture. Uh, money uh, brings security. Well, it's, <laughs> it's not, doesn't really. It brings security for a short time. It can, money can only protect you for a certain length of time. And I'll just pick one more. Money gives you worth as a person. Well, the Bible says your worth is based on what God says not on your bank statement. And there are a lot of others there you could look at uh, on the subject of money. So James is saying you've got to view wealth like a Christian. And he says, if you per persevere under these trials, you know, the trials of tribulation, if you persevere uh, in seeking God for wisdom, if you persevere in the right attitude to wealth, he says, you will receive a crown of life. <laughs> And it's not a golden crown with jewels. It's more like the Olympic winner of the Olympics. They used to receive a laurel, uh, a laurel wreath upon their head. The imagery that uh, James is using is of winning the Olympic race. The Lord will bless you for standing and being single-minded under these trials. Well, let's look at the last point. Um, and that's a slightly different uh, point, And that's temptation. Uh, where James talks about temptation uh, in verses uh, 14 and 15 particularly. Trials are things that happen to you externally. It's like the rough and tough of life, and you need to have the right attitude. You know, a, a hard life makes a hardy, a hardy Christian. <laughs> temptation is something on the inside. It's something that is left within you, perhaps from your old nature, from your flesh, which is attracted to something out outside. Um, and the imagery James uses is of fishing. You know, a fish is attracted to what the bait on the hook because there's something in the fish that wants the bait. Uh, uh, what it often doesn't realize, though, well, I think it never realizes, is that there's a hook behind the bait, however nice the bait looks. And different fish are attracted by different types of bait. Uh, for example, a trout likes flies, I'm told. <laughs> and cr we as people, as Christians, we're attracted by different things. What tempts, what tempts Simon is not the same thing as what tempts Norman, for example. We, we got, we're attracted by different things. But James is saying you need to have a Christian attitude towards temptation uh, when it comes. And he gives a great scientific insight into temptation. Um, he says this, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So he uses this imagery of birth, and I'm sorry to say, the imagery of sex. And um, he actually says temptation is rather like um it's when you, you're drawn away by your this is what the process you start imagining something in your imagination you start to fantasize about it uh, you entertain it in your mind it becomes a fantasy something you long for uh, based on perhaps an old bad passion that you had and if you entertain it long enough and imagine it and fantasize about it 
there will be conception. And you can see in that picture there, we have a sperm entering an egg. A conception occurs where you haven't physically done the sin, but it's conceived in your heart. And the quite scary thing about this is that when someone uh, has conceived, nobody else knows about it for a long time. You know, there could be something growing in the womb for nine months um, before it ever comes out. And it's like that with temptation. People um, get tempted, they fantasize, they conceive, and it's there, it's hidden. But it, nobody really knows about it. But eventually there will be a birth. Now, the birth is when you actually physically sin. You go and act on what's been tempting you. And it likens it to having a child. It says gives birth to sin. And uh, if you then continue in that sin, then it gives birth to a grandchild. There's a child called sin, and then there's a grandchild called death, which means you'll just be cut more and more cut off from God, physically and spiritually. So what James is calling us to do is to have a Christian attitude to temptation. Don't think you can play with temptation, dabble with it, and get away with it. You've got to be ruthless. You've got to uh, strangle it on the threshold of your mind. Don't entertain it or fantasize about it. Uh, nip it in the bud. Because if you don't, you will be what is written on that t-shirt. <laughs> you will be an accident just waiting to happen. Give it time and it will come out. So James is calling them to, uh, to be single-minded, uh, to resist the temptation. And next week, we're going to talk more about the Word of God as the kind of method, the prescription, if you like, uh, to stop this kind of wandering and temptation happening. There's a lovely old proverb. Um, I think Martin Luther said it. Uh, he said this, you can stop birds flying over your head, but you, sorry, you can't stop birds flying over your head, but you can stop them making nests in your hair. And that's what we're to do with temptation. Uh, we're not to let it um, be grounded in us. My last slide. I think chapter one of James is a call against double-mindedness. It's saying you can't really decide to do A and B when you're faced with a choice. If you're faced with a trial, you have to go God's way. If you're faced with uh, issues of wisdom, go God's way. If you're faced with issues of wealth and riches, go God's way. Temptation, go God's way. If you choose route A, you're following your desires. You're being enticed. And eventually that leads to sin and death. Uh, and that's the world's friend of the world. If you choose route B, you are following God's way. You're being single-minded. You're being a friend of God. And uh, that will lead to life. And there is a great danger that a trial has the potential to become a temptation. You know, what you go through, you can be tempted to, uh, for example, if you're under stress, you could be tempted to go into certain sins, secret sins that nobody knows about. And uh, James is saying you need wisdom to be godly. You need to resist such things. So there's a lot in the book of James. It's a call to stay faithful and steadfast to God and not become a friend of the world. Um, I think I'll end there for today because we've got a lot more to cover. We're going to have Mark Thomas speaking to us. We've got Tony speaking to us and myself. Um, but as we conclude now, um, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a song called Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me. And the reason I put that song in there uh, it was chosen was because we don't face trials and temptations alone. We've got Christ in us. And he has given us the grace to say no. Uh, we are not like Oscar Wilde, the great English writer. Oscar Wilde said, famously, he said, the only way to deal with temptation in my book is to give into it, <laughs> to give into it. Well, we're not like Oscar Wilde. We have Christ. So we're going to sing... Uh, uh, not yet not I but Christ in you. Let's, let me just pray and then we'll sing our final song. Lord bless you. Lord, we thank you for the book of James and we pray that we will learn from it, Lord, that it will affect our lives, that you will put things deep in our hearts that will help us be single-minded about trials, be single-minded about wealth, about wisdom and about temptation. Help us
be friends of God as Abraham was uh, and help Christ Church you all to live godly, wise lives. In Jesus' name, amen.